so just to, you know again to, to rephrase the the basic assumptions of relativity is that the speed of light should be oh, sorry not the speed of light I'm jumping ahead of myself um, the laws of physics should behave the same in all in all reference frames so more generally you know if you can express it something mathematically it shouldn't matter what reference frame you're viewing the universe in you should all agree mathematically on what the what the universe is doing. So one example of this that is kind of a, a, a weird thing to think about is the idea of uh, basically the, the apparent magnetic force. So example, a charged particle traveling through a magnetic field. I hope you're gonna read that. So, so we're looking at a charged particle in nearby a uh, wire that's carrying current, basically. And the, the way I'm gonna draw this up here. So let's say we have some wire and, you know, just a, a normal everyday average wire. There is, you know, for whatever reason, we're carrying current to the right. So the current is, is moving to the right. And we're gonna take some charged particle here. So let's, like that, plus Q. And we're gonna take, I'm gonna draw it a little more neatly. We're going to take that charged particle plus Q and we're going to flick it to the right at some velocity V. Now, again, I'm just going to a little bit more clearly indicate the current is moving to the right here. So hopefully it makes sense. So um, I just, I, I'm going to stop talking for one moment, but those of you who are sitting at home watching this, Think about what's going to happen. If you flick that particle to the right, it has a positive charge. There's a current that's flowing to the right. Now it's, you know, it's some continuous wire. I haven't just drawn the end arbitrarily. So, so what's going to happen? And, and by the way, I'm thinking it through myself right now. So, okay. So just, you know, point, like, even if you're sitting by yourself in, in your room or whatever, or better yet, sitting around with your friends or your mates, point in the direction of space of what's going to happen for this thing here. So, I mean, clearly it's going to the right, but it's going to do something other than just go to the right. And we'll see that here by drawing this out. So I'm not just going to say it's going a certain direction. We're, you, I'm going to prove it to you. So a current carrying wire, if we, if we think of this as little tiny positive charges that are moving to the right, now, we know that's not actually what current is. It's actually, in fact, electrons that are moving to the left. But, and, and by the way, one other question, how did we discover that? What experiment told us that it's actually negative charges moving to the right? That was, that was the Hall experiment, by the way, H-A-L-L. -L. The Hall experiment told us it's actually negative charges moving left. Ow. <laughs> it's actually negative charges moving leftwards. Anyway, the whole point is, it's, it, we can think of it as positive charges moving to the right. There's another positive charge moving to the right. From the wire, using the right-hand rule, current flowing to the right will generate a magnetic field. And I'm going to display the magnetic field in red here. So the magnetic field is going to come out of the board above it. And... It's going to, so, so I'm going to just draw this as B here. It comes out of the board here, it wraps around, and then it re-enters the board here, and I'm going to draw it B like that. So we have an inward pointing magnetic field. Now hopefully you remember that's what those arrows mean. If we're viewing the dot, that means we're viewing the point of the arrow coming at you. If you're seeing the X, that means you're viewing the tail of the arrow, the cross feathers going away from you. So just as a reminder. So in the presence of an internally pointing magnetic field, B, if we have a positive charge Q, what's it gonna do? Remember, the force on, a, on any charged particle in the presence of magnetic field is, and I'll call this F super B. The magnetic force is going to be equal to, and hopefully you recall this, it's always gonna be proportional to the charge of the object of interest, of course, if it's five coulombs, it's gonna have five times as much, much force as one coulomb. That's Q and then V cross B. So in other words, not only the more charged it is, the, 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 the higher the magnetic force it appears, but the faster it goes and the stronger the magnetic field that's in. And notice that it's cross product here. And that means that 
you have to use your silly right-hand rule. And by the way, my favorite exams to proctor ever in the world are physics two exams just after you've gotten gotten to like the cross product and any and m because like it's an hour's worth of watching people just do this like you know and not think that there's anything weird of, of themselves doing that for like an hour straight so anyway um we take v going to the right cross it with b going down into the board the force is going to point upwards so i'll draw that in green it has a rightwards velocity but it's going to experience an upwards force. And if you wanted, you could describe this as, for example, the, the velocity is in the i-hat direction. The magnetic field strength, you could say, is the negative z-hat direction, or negative k-hat, if you will. And the force, the resulting force, points in the y-hat, j-hat, or the y-direction. So in this case here, because the laws of physics predict based on the setting that you should experience an upwards force, this particle here should actually experience that force until it just collides with that wire. So we have a very definite prediction on what should happen if you do this. Now, hopefully you agree with me. So if not, or if this wasn't quite clear, you know, just pause it and go back through what assumptions we made and how we, how we predicted that it must be deflected upwards here. But let me now kind of play devil's advocate for our basic assumption that the laws of physics should be the same in, in all inertial frames. And again, to be clear, when we say an, an inertial frame, what I mean by that, and I guess I, I'm guilty of using that without really explaining it. All I mean by that is, um, I do want to write it out. It means that any other reference frame moving at a constant velocity to the first. Or, or in the example that I, I gave with uh, Sally and Svensson or whatever, um, Sally was the, the original uh, reference frame and Svensson was another reference frame. And because he was moving past Sally at a constant velocity, we'll say he was an inertial reference frame as well. So the point is though that if physics works the way that Einstein realized it really needs to work, if the universe doesn't care who you are or where you're looking from, if it always wants to have the same results no matter what observers are viewing the results, we need to check whether this experiment that we just did makes sense from a different reference frame. And specifically, think for yourself. Uh, I'm going to get rid of some of the ex Well, no, I'm just going to leave it as is. Um, think for yourself. Is maybe a, uh, well, actually, let, let's go back a little bit. Um, what reference frame did we analyze this from before? Specifically, how can you describe the conditions under which we've just analyzed this. So hopefully you, you can see that the conditions that we're analyzing under are conditions under which basically the wire is standing still, or more precisely, we're seeing that charged particle Q moving at a velocity of V. So what we call the lab, the lab conditions. Is there any other reference frame that might be uniquely interesting to consider? You know, you could you consider an infinite number of other reference frames, but instead of that lab reference frame where you're not moving, not moving, there's one other reference frame that is really interesting to consider. Which would that be? That's the reference frame where you are co-moving with that particle Q. So I'm going to say consider a co-moving reference frame that moves alongside Q. So I hope that makes sense. So consider a co-moving reference frame with plus Q. In other words, our new reference frame is, so we, we had our original model here, and here was our current I going through. Here was our particle Q at some velocity V. Now I'm going to create a reference frame. So there's my new coordinates here. And I'm going to label that S prime. 
So I, I, I hope you see that it's a little bit sloppy here. Um, but I'm gonna label the coordinate system S prime. So Svensson, there, there's multiple S's is where I was going with that example. So our new coordinate system now is going to be traveling to the right. And it's gonna be traveling just fast enough to keep up with our charged particle Q. In other words, our new, and I should be labeling this with vectors there, our new coordinate system S prime is moving just fast enough to keep up along with the, the particle Q. So S prime tells us our co-moving coordinate at speed V And we'll say it's along with Q, the, the charge uh, plus Q. So we're moving right along with that. So think for yourself now. And, and while you do that, I'm going to redraw this a little bit larger. But think for yourself. If you're moving along with that moving charge, what you're going to see in that case. And this is where things really start to like trip up your brain a little bit. Or hopefully. So let me draw this here. We have the current I. We have our charge Q plus Q, and Q is moving to the right at a velocity V, but we now have our coordinate system S prime there. That's also moving to the right at velocity V. Okay, so do you see what, what what's the potential like pitfall we have now is? If we're moving alongside the particle Q, at this point, here's going to be the wire. Now, let's, let's not even worry about how like current might look different in a different, fr in a different frame. So in other words, that magnetic field that we had was there before. You know, we can naively assume it's still there. We don't need to make any assumption about that at all, though, in fact. So I'm going to put a question mark there, and I'm going to, I'm going to actually remove that in a moment. So we, it's possible the magnetic field might still exist if we're moving along with that particle. But that doesn't matter, because if we're moving along with that particle plus Q, all of a sudden, if we've repositioned ourselves in a reference frame where we're traveling alongside it, we have the velocity of Q is zero. I hope that makes sense. And I'm going to write that a little bit differently. I'm going to write V prime of Q. And this is going to be really important to keep track of those primes. Now, why did I write that? That's because we're now viewing it from the coordinate system S prime. So we're recalculating the velocity of that particle in coordinate system S prime now. So if the velocity of that particle now has zero velocities, whatever, um, if the if velocity of particle is now zero, what is the magnetic force on that particle now? And I'm going to draw that as F prime or I'll call it as Fb prime, the magnetic force in the primed coordinate system. It's gonna be Q times V prime times, or sorry, I'm sorry, crossed with whatever the magnetic field strength is gonna be in our coordinate system B, uh, um, S prime. So I hope you see where those primes are, are entering here. This is, you use a prime when you're describing that quantity from your moving coordinate system. If you were to remove that prime, that describes that value from the unprimed coordinate system or the lab, the, the lab coordinate system. Those are now our two distinct coordinate systems. So no matter what that B prime is, which it might still be the same, it might have changed, turns out it doesn't matter because if you're moving alongside that particle, that is zero. So here is the fundamental conundrum. In, in the coordinate system S, this is non-zero. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's not going to be zero as long as you have a charge, a velocity, and a magnetic field. And we've assumed all three of those things will be true. And this here, under the same assumptions, but viewed strictly from a different frame of view, says that the coordinate system in S prime predicts that we're not going to have a magnetic force. This breaks the universe. If Einstein is right, if the, if the laws of physics have to apply no matter what reference frame you're in, this is a perfect example of where the universe breaks. 
or more specifically, this is an example of where if we don't use the proper transformations, we get an answer that seems to disobey any sort of like reasonable laws of the universe. So this is what, this is what gave us an idea that the, basically the background and how we viewed how physics works previously doesn't work under certain very, you know, certain specific translations. And so Einstein's theory of relativity asks the question of, well, how do you translate this coordinate system into that coordinate system so that you both predict the same force? Because the force shouldn't depend on what coordinate system you're viewing it from. It's the, the particle is either going to rise to that wire or it's not going to, you know, no matter what you're seeing it from. So that's what relativity attempts to answer. How do you do that transformation from one to the other and keep that force invariant? And that's a really important word. So I'm going to pause here now again for some questions, but we're going to come back to this and look at another example of how we rectify that and then see whether that will actually hold up.